I learned many, many years ago that nothing happens until something is sold. And for over 40 years, I've loved selling, getting to grips with negotiation and discovering the power of good communication. But boy, has it all changed and I've had to run fast to keep pace with it. And I reckon a pivotal change is about to happen again. I know that from these Meet the Leader interviews that wise companies are already planning how they can both recover and up their sales momentum, but others need to get started. However, where to start and where will change happen? Today, I bring you top insight from Youthwit International, in my mind, the global leader in sales negotiation and communication training. So let me introduce you to the CEO, Tony Hughes. Hello, Tony. Lovely to see you. Hi, well, Malcolm. Nice to see you too. Great. And we're all in summer, summer mode here in, in the UK, <laughs> aren't we? You know? We are indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's, it's only UK. today. Only today. Only today. Right. Um, so, Tony, let's start with you giving us a brief overview of Huthwaite International and what it does. Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, Huthwaite International started around almost 50 years ago. Wow. Uh, and it started as a research business looking at what made people good when they were successful so what were they doing differently when they were successful to when they weren't successful so not yeah. not identifying top performers but everybody especially in sales is good at some at something someday and yeah. what do they do differently yeah and, and ma mainly with looking at what people say how they communicate with each other yeah and when you say international are you all over the globe um, well, everybody says when they're a global business, when you actually look at it, it's, it's very difficult to be a truly global business, yeah. but, uh, I've worked in 65 countries and we've delivered <laughs> our training in 48 languages. So I suppose we're about as global as you'd yeah. expect. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty, pretty good. As you heard in my opening piece, I'm committed to the value of selling. Why do so many boardrooms and companies think they can reduce their sales teams and their selling activity? Isn't this just false economy and likely to set them backward and not forward? Um, well, as to why, I, I, some of it is people believe that their products virtually sell themselves. And, and you'll hear people, particularly since we've got new technology that, you know, the website's enough and the website will do this for us and that for us. But in effect, a website is a, an electronic brochure. Yeah. And, and, and what it tends to do, the best marketing do really is, is to communicate value if you've got sellers that only do the same thing, you've basically got a very expensive talking website. So you, you can see that unless the boards believe that sellers are doing something different, then why would they want a very expensive talking website when they've already, when they've already got one? So it comes down to that view that sellers are there to communicate value and tell people what their products are about. And if mm. websites can do that, why do I need salespeople? Mm. In, in the USA, where I've presented sales conferences and I'm presently interviewing leaders, um, there's an excitement about selling uh, and getting the order. And that mm. comes from the top. Why does the UK appear to be so reluctant to sell? So why do boards treat selling at a distance? Um, well, I mean, comparing the UK and the US is quite difficult just yeah. in isolation yeah. to selling because there's lots of other uh, cultural factors there, obviously. But, but but fundamentally, I think it's a misunderstanding. I think it's a misunderstanding around what salespeople are there to do because we've all been on the receiving end of bad selling and mm. been told what to do. And I think once once the once people wake up to the fact that selling is a is a skill and it's about mm. creating value for customers rather yeah. than communicating value for customers, getting underneath their skin, helping them solve the problems. Then when you get to that point, I think people will start to realize just how important it is. And I think part of that issue as well is with education. You know, I think mm. education, uh, there are lots of marketing degrees, but there aren't any selling degrees in the UK. Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. Uh, it's said, by the way, that one in four companies have someone from procurement on the board, but only one in 12 have a salesperson on the board. Okay, mm. the figures may be average, but why do you think this is, and, and should it change? Well, well, some of it goes back to those things I've just said, and I, and I think in terms of procurement, the, the big issue, sorry, the big driver on procurement was the recession in 2008. Yeah. We've done a lot of research into procurement, and prior to that, there weren't that many people sat on the board from procurement. But, of course, 
people got into saving their business via cost cutting. Yeah. And then having done that, realized that actually these were good practices anyway. We don't really want to stop these practices. We need to carry them on as well as grow the business, in which case the margins grow. And, and I think we need, a, we need a similar driver for sales. We need a similar revolution for sales. And I'm not sure this pandemic is going to cause that, but even though we're going to go into a recession. But, but I do hope that businesses start to see it isn't just about cost cutting. Most have done that over the last three months. It's now got to be about right skilling their people to be able to be more commercial, to be able to compete with um, their, their other competitors. Yeah, I quite agree. We we've we don't say bounce back. We say bounce ahead, because this is an opportunity for the agile company to get out there and win those customers that uh, that are faltering. You know, I, I despair that too many companies though will invest in expensive training for say their HR or accounts teams, but then look for the cheapest or even free training for their salespeople. When I ask why, they tell me that if they spend on sales training, the salespeople are likely to move to, say, a competitor, so it will be wasted money. What should they be thinking instead? Uh, well, with the first point, I think people do spend on HR and accountancy training, and part of that is if you're a CEO like me, those two things are fairly black arts. So yeah. you, have to, you have to accept <laughs> yeah. what people tell you, really. I'm a salesman at heart, so I, I just kind of go, well, okay, you've got to spend the money on that, that's fine. But in terms of the sales training, I, it, it's, it's false economy. If you look at what it would cost to train somebody well, let's, mm. call, it, let's call it 1,500 pounds or something like that, per, plus a couple of days off. If you can't make that money back from a salesperson uh, in a very short period of time, and I mean in terms of margin, not just in terms of revenue, there's something wrong in the business, either with the salespeople with the products or, or with your internal systems. And yeah. uh, um, for example, we're in the business of making good people better, not taking people off the street and turning them into salespeople usually, and teaching people how to sell your own products better and your own services better. You know, that's, that, that's false economy to not do that. And if you mm. look at, um, you mentioned the US before Malcolm, but if you look at the fluidity of the labor market in the US where people do move around a lot more, yeah. They spend billion, billions on sales training yep. to make sure that those people can sell their products up to speed as quickly as they can and make the best use of the time that they're there. Yeah, so, to, so true then. Um, what should businesses be thinking about investing in uh, what I'm calling new selling? Well, I hear the word new selling quite a lot and, um, you know, the, the, and it's great. There's lots of new technology out there that helps us, what we're doing now, virtual mm -hmm. media. CRM systems, lots of other platforms, provision of big data. Now, that, a lot of that stuff makes us more uh, efficient, shall we say. It helps us to target. It helps us to qualify. Uh, so it's, a, it's an efficiency thing for me, really. But I think we have to understand that um, the decisions are still, for the time being at least, made by people. Yeah. Now, I'm, not, I'm not a great adherer to the adage that people buy from people. Um, I, I'm more to the point that, the way that people make decisions is by weighing things up, what's good for them and what's bad for them. Mm -hmm. And the job of a good salesman is to weigh one side against the other. Yeah. Um, but, in, but in a way where the value is to the customer, not what I yeah. think is valuable, mm -hmm. but what you think is valuable, which is why yeah. you asked us before about international. We, we do a similar training all over the world, but what somebody might find valuable to them in, in Japan, for example, might be different to what they'd find valuable in America. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, uh, it's easier to teach somebody, to a Japanese person to sell in Japan than it is to teach an American to sell yeah. in Japan, or yeah. vice versa, because yeah. what people value is different and the value is about the person. It's not about the product or service. Mm -hmm. so, so as long as people make decisions in the same way, then I think all, most of those other technology um, principles are, 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 or tools are there to add to efficiency. Okay, I got you now. So how would you say the virtual selling process is different from the usual face-to-face -face process? And what should companies be doing about this new process? Well, I think the first thing they've got to do is embrace it. It's not yeah, going away. Yeah, yeah. It might reduce a little bit from where we are, but it's not going away. Um, mm -hmm. There is a new skill set to learn, stage skills to learn, where to look in the camera, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. What, what, what we've found recently, because we've obviously got a lot of people coming to us now to say, how oh, do we do this virtually, is it's a little bit too easy virtually to press that share screen button and have the prop of the 
PowerPoint slides and yeah. you're looking at them and you talk all the old problems that we've had, they're, they're coming back. So mm-hmm. I think you've got to embrace it. That's the first thing. Recognize that you're probably going to have less time with people, but easier access to people. Yes. Um, and therefore, less time for pleasantries. People want to get on with the jobs quicker, but, but you've really got to embrace that technology at the moment. Yeah, and, and the, cut, cut down, as you quite rightly say, the time um, so that people don't think they're going to have to spend an hour on face to face because it's exhausting, isn't it? It's called Zoom anxiety, I hear. It can be exhausting, yes. Yeah. If you try training programs, that's. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you mean in your trademark strap line? Change behavior, change results. Um, well, virtually everything that, that we do is is um, a result of some sort of behavior. So mm-hmm. if, if you can work out what the right behaviors are to use at the right time with the right people, then you should get improved results. You're right. Now, now, now the, the, point, the point of that is um, changing behavior is not easy. First of all, you've got to decide what the right behaviors are. As I said, changing it is not easy. And, and most organizations, that's where they fail because they, they don't put the support and the systems in place and the coaching and the monitoring and, and all those things that are going to motivate and help, in our case, salespeople to change hmm. to positive behaviors, which will make a, uh, a big difference. Having said that, we all use these behaviors all the time. It's just using more of the good ones and less of the bad ones. And right. a lot of it is identifying that and getting people to then coach that, say, within organizations. Yeah, so do you think we all need to become sales psychologists then? Uh, no, I don't think it's about being a, a, a psychologist. I think it is It is a matter of understanding the people you're talking to, yeah. or at least taking heed of them, rather than it all just being about yourself. Obviously, yeah. being customer-focused is not a new thing, but but and, and it's an easy word to say, but it's not necessarily that easy to actually make, make happen. The most mm. most of these behavior change um, implementations in businesses fall down between the first line management who have been told what to do by the people up here who have actually bought their training for them. And and obviously you need a cascade. You need it to be all through the business at various yep. levels. Totally. And all behind it. Yeah, yeah. Um, many years ago, I was waiting in an airport in, uh, in Washington. And as you do when you're airport, you're browsing through books. And I picked out a book which I bought called The Spin Selling System. And oh, yeah. I have a long been admirer of, of it. So please tell everybody what it is. And importantly, what's the return on investment of such a system? Okay. Well, first of all, Spin belongs to Huthway. That was It was written by um, Neil Rackham, uh, yeah. uh, who started our business. Um, and basically, right at the beginning of, the, of this interview, I talked about the research that we've done into communication. Um, in doing that, companies like IBM and Xerox picked up that if you could measure success and what people did differently in communication, you could do it in sales because mm. you could measure success. So SPIN is basically a distillation of a lot of behaviors down to nine significantly, uh, statistically significant behaviors that make a difference when people are selling. So right. it's a, it was the first consultative sales model, certainly that. And uh, so SPIN is an acronym of four questions, situation, problem, implication, need, payoff. That's more or less makes it the name of a, a program but it's there to help people to get to understand people's needs, but also to help them develop it. So if, if there's anything where there's psychologists that you came into yeah. talked about a few minutes ago, this is where you are because you're trying to, to not just find out what somebody wants and sell it to them, but you're trying to get them to understand for themselves what would be beneficial to them looking into the future. Now, right. if you just talk about return on investment, every training company I know can publish um can publish testimonials to say that people's sales have gone up um and, and of course so can we but if they ask me what the main return on investment is for spin it is around its effectiveness in shortening people's sales cycle it's the mm. fact that if you can use these behaviors people are starting to um to, to to buy on the value that they see which means that not only do the sales cycles reduce but also the margins go up because right. when you come to the negotiations phase, yeah. the value's there, so it's easier to negotiate and retain the value. 
Excellent. Yeah. So I do hope that people pop along to this URL here, uthwetinternational.com and find out a bit more about SPIN because it's a great system. Buyers, and I deal with uh, procurement managers in, in private and public sector, are improving their negotiation skills, especially for complex purchases. What, uh, what should sellers be doing and how does Huthwet help? Um. Well, that in itself is very complex. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but if I can look at it in a very simple way, you've always got to put yourself in the shoes of the other people mm -hmm. and recognize, and recognize particularly if they are professional buyers, that uh, that might be quite difficult to really understand what their background is. But you've also got to recognize that they have to buy things. Yeah. They have to have a solution. And wherever you are on this continuum, a simple continuum, say between commodity and being vital to them, will make a difference to that negotiation. But but in a simple terms, I, I like to explain it in, in this way. So if you imagine this is the buyer and this is the seller, the job of the seller is to create enough value for the buyer to move towards them. Yes. There'll be a little bit of movement from the seller, but to move towards them during the selling process. So we have an overlap and then we start to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, all too often, the sellers move towards the buyer by giving things away. Yeah. It's yeah. the negotiation. So by the time they get there, they're pushed below where they want to be, shall we say. So, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the kind of golden rule of negotiation is don't unless you have to. So sell, you always will have to, but do as much of the value creation as you can prior to that negotiation. And then negotiation is about retaining the value for both sides. Yes. So both sides yeah. want to get value out of this. So that's where that negotiation complex skills really become um, very important. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. you know, don't give the salesman the opportunity of giving thirty-two percent discount because that's what he or she will yeah, give. That's, what, that's what we all end up with. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Sometimes start that way. I'm a great believer that the way forward for the UK is increasing our exports, which is why you know here as mentioned we've got our Sell Global channel. What are the key issues that companies need to focus on if they're to improve their export sales? Well, I mean, I mean, we've certainly they've got better tools now because we've just been talking about the acceptance of virtual um, communication, which is yeah. obviously one of those things which is going to help them do it. I think they have to focus on the fact that um, not not all, uh, and we talked about this earlier, but not all uh, countries and individuals see value as being the same. Mm. You know, you, you you have to recognise that yes, your product, your service has a value. It might save people money. It might be more efficient. It might be more effective but not necessarily in all those um, countries that you're exporting to, is that going to be the prime uh, driver, shall we say. There may be other things around relationship, longer term, that kind of stuff. So, so it really does um, rely upon um, not necessarily being a cultural expert. That's extremely difficult yeah. but in every culture. But, but again, to, to, to remember to make sure that you're dealing with that person as an individual and that person may not have the same values and cultural background that you've got mm. so so that's quite important and obviously prior to this pandemic you know, the uh, the big issue was as um, uk coming out of europe and that was starting to be an even bigger issue about how do we work with negotiate and export to other countries yeah um, and that hasn't gone away you know we might have been distracted by it but it hasn't gone away no i've just finished my 101st podcast on beyond brexit <laughs> that's that's how sad i am but never mind it looks like we're going for a no deal outcome so um there's a lot of uh, sales changes needed i think that now communication both internally and externally in my mind is not just poor in the uk but globally and, and i'm yeah. finding that on these meet the leader interviews the bigger the company it seems the worse the communication it often happens there to me too many companies seem happy to stick with how it is. Surely that's wrong and a danger for the company. What should they be thinking about and about communication? Well, I mean, it's it's an old um, it, it's an old saying, but it's two way. You know, communication goes both ways. Yeah. Um, and and the, and I think you have to decide in communication. You have to decide what its purpose is. You have to decide why we're doing this, and there should normally be an outcome to it, unless it's just chit chat, which is fine. And, and for us, this is the world that, that we live in. The communication is a, for us is around the verbal communication. It's the way that, that people speak to each other. Yeah. Um, 
there are lots of other channels now which you've got to be very careful of as we're all aware all social media channels etc cetera, etc cetera. but i think the way that people speak to each other is fascinating and uh and you can you can upskill people in that way and if you look as an example of that if you look at um, interview techniques that have happened over the last few years i i i've seen so many people criticize the way that the press and the media interview people in it being aggressive Hmm. So, so people are recognizing that that's aggressive yeah. because of some behavior that somebody is, is using. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. when we see people interviewing on these techniques here, that's, that's completely different. Mm. Cause you can't get away with that same level of interruption and that same level of oppression and, and trying to drive people into a, into a certain place. So, so communication covers a whole raft of things inside businesses, internal communication is absolutely important. We've got lots of research that talk about that talks about the number of misconceptions that people have when they come out of meetings. Yeah, uh, everybody, you know, no matter how good you are, usually comes out with at least one point seven. I think it runs out at misconceptions per meeting, up to about fifteen. <laughs> right. So, so once you spread that, you've yeah. been talking a lot about. We've been talking about our numbers quite a lot recently. If you are a number of reproduction of misconceptions, yeah. <laughs> it's the one that anybody understands anything. Yeah, I've, that's a great analogy. Really good. I, I suggest that too many sales leaders are of the old school. And if that salesperson's not out knocking on doors, often fruitlessly, then they think that the salesperson's not doing the job. Do you think companies use their sales teams as opportunity seekers? Um, allow them to indicate, undertake consultative selling, finding out what a client's growth plans are, offer strategic help, building relationship. Do they do that enough? Is change needed? Um, I don't think they do it enough. I think change is needed. I think, I think the, uh, the, the knock-on effect has been what you talked about earlier, really, which is because um, people aren't doing that. Uh, they're not valued, so they got rid of and yeah. cause, because people can do things technologically-wise rather than have those salespeople. But if you could get those salespeople to do those things that you just mentioned, um, and they take time, of course, so you do have to decide where you're going to put the efforts into what clients are you going to put that, that uh, consultative yeah. effort, yeah. then, then sales, um, sales will improve. But even back into the, uh, shall we say, mid-90s, you know, we were prophesizing there would be a reduction in salespeople because of all the things that have been going on. My view now is there may be a reduction in those people that are called salespeople and have direct sales roles, but the number of people in an organization who are actually selling has yeah. gone up. Yeah. Strategic, strategic selling become more important it's than so transaction. Many different levels. So, so there's yeah. just strategic selling from the board all the way down and then right down to even, uh, if you think about consultants or even engineers that have, contact with the clients hmm. they have more day-to-day -day contact than salespeople do yes and yeah and the enlightened organizations are taking advantage of that and bringing them into that fold of, of not necessarily being salespeople but at least understanding what it is that salespeople do yeah and and certainly not um cer certainly not countering it you know with the old hmm. kind of who sold you that then it must be one of our yeah. salespeople yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, I think it's spreading out through the whole organisations, and people have to recognise that commercial, um, that commercial value of anybody who has customer-facing contact. Mm. I, I've always been proud, by the way, of, of being a salesperson. I've never, I've never hidden that. Whereas some people say, "Well, oh, you'll never get on in life if you, if you, if you, if you do that," you know. Uh, finally, Tony. A business card with that on. <laughs> yeah. Finally, Tony. It's G in the lamp time. You've got three wishes. Three wishes for the future of sales and negotiation profession, not just here in the UK, but for our global viewers and listeners. What do you wish for? Um, I, think, I think I wish for people to see the value of it, of, yeah. of, of that commerciality. Of, and, and it isn't just about me trying to get somebody to buy something that they don't want, which is mm -hmm. the fear factor that people yeah. seem to have. To. I'd like to see it become um, much more professional and, and, that's a that's a that's a difficult one because as soon as you become professional, it means adhering to certain things, and part of the part of the skill of a salespeople is to do things which is different yeah. to what other people are doing. So, but, yeah. but but so maybe for profession, we need to get ethical. We need to get people to understand that sales should be and is 
um, an ethical um, profession to be in, mm -hmm. if you can call it a yeah. profession, but certainly an ethical job. Um, and, and it's a simple, I guess this is an interesting one for me. I once, I once spoke to our old marketing manager on a train and she was talking about what her son wanted to be. And I said, has he ever thought about being a salesman? And we had a conversation about it and nobody ever thinks about being a salesman. Nobody ever comes out of school saying, or goes to the mm -hmm. career teacher saying, I want to be a salesman. I want to be an engineer, I want to be in marketing, I want to do it. So, so I think for me, it would be a wonderful success if I was in schools and asking what people wanted to do, which I have done in other places like China, by the way, yeah. in the UK, to be able to say, and somebody say, well, I want to be a salesman. Now, that, that I think would be the ultimate uh, yeah. success. I wanted to be a salesman to escape Carlisle, but that was in the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Hughes of Youth Waste International, I have thoroughly enjoyed having a chat to you about my favourite subject about selling. Thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I've enjoyed it.